Um, my name is Caroline Bruce and, and I'm Head of Programme with um, NHS Education for Scotland and my role is within the National Trauma Training Programme and so I'm going to give you the slightly dull bit which hopefully will be not as dull as um, it could be, which is really about the training resources um, that are available from the National Trauma Training Programme. Can I have the next slide please? I just wanted to highlight from that last slide, and you will get copies of them, that we have a website where a lot of what I'm going to speak about will, will be available from, and some of these visuals are as well. But I wanted to kick off just by saying, why would we have a National Trauma Training Programme? And one of our phrases that we think is, is really critical is trauma is everybody's business. And that certainly came through from Lena's presentation just there, is that we know now more than ever before that the impact of trauma and adversity, both in early childhood and later on in adulthood, has huge and massive implications um, throughout all of our lives when we experience it. And we also know it's more common um, than we maybe first understood. And so this tree on the right hand side really tries to give a bit of a sense as to when trauma and adversity happens earlier on in life and in adulthood in the context of, of other adversity, it can, it can, doesn't have to, but it can lead to a whole range of different adverse outcomes. And that's across mental health, like higher risk of further mental health harm, higher rates of substance misuse and health harming behaviours, physical health, mental health difficulties, preventable diseases, higher risk of early death, um, but also social outcomes, reduced opportunities, relationship risks and educational difficulties in contact with the justice system. Um, and that reduced opportunities also includes um, reduced opportunities in terms of housing. Um, and, and I think it's really important at this point to say adversity is not destiny. You know, this tree is growing, could grow in 101 different ways. And the place where we can really intervene is trying to understand what are the factors that link between early adversity and trauma and, and later on some of these outcomes. And, and actually, it sits in the main with our capacity as humans to be able to adapt to the trauma we're being exposed to at the time, to be able to survive it. And people show remarkable resilience in being able to survive our traumatic experiences. Difficulties in managing strong emotions, though, can arise from that because quite understandably those emotions are there for a reason. They're there to try and protect us, to get us to escape from danger. Risky strategies to manage distress like substance misuse because we've got to manage it somehow. And difficulties in relationships with others, for example, with trust. And actually that is what keeps us safe. If we learn that other trauma most often happens in relationships and therefore we're going to learn that we've got to be really suspicious around other people. So those kind of three key factors can really lead to some of those outcomes which are not inevitable and that's what trauma-informed practice is all about. It's about recognising the inequalities that the impact of trauma can lead to unless we are actively trauma-informed in our approach and take that into account. Next slide please. So this is um, a, a slightly complicated looking slide but it's really I think language really really matters. What do we mean when we're talking about trauma versus what do we mean when we're talking about adversity? So on the left hand side there you probably re be relatively familiar with some of the ad adverse childhood experiences literature on the left hand side there you can see some of those aces which we would say as being adverse and then within the adverse childhood experiences we also have traumatic experiences such as emotional abuse physical abuse and sexual abuse and they can also happen in adulthood so towards the right hand side you've got trauma in adulthood um, and we know that there are significant links between exposure to those early childhood traumatic events and the likelihood of later traumatic events happening as well. And we we multiply talk about different kinds of traumatic events. So we can have single incident trauma at the bottom, like an acute health crisis or rape or road traffic accident. But then we can have complex trauma or repeated traumatic events. That's chronic life threatening illness, for example, domestic abuse, sexual abuse in adulthood, etc. Next click, please. And on top of all that, we're in a global pandemic and there's a whole range of ways in which that overlaps across that. So we're all being exposed to the uncertain threat of COVID-19 and the impact that it might have on us and our, 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 our loved ones. And we're also being exposed to the fact that it's uncertain in terms of our relationships. We don't know where the threat lies. We don't know where potential um, infection from COVID-19 might come from. It might come from our nearest and dearest. It might come from, from complete strangers. So there's an unpredictable nature of traumatic events which COVID-19 really, really taps into in terms of not knowing where the threat is and when, and also not knowing when it's going to be ended. So COVID-19 could be thought of as a potentially traumatising event in and of itself. But we also know that the things that we have done to try and keep everybody safe, which absolutely is the right thing to do, means that some of us who've experienced trauma, the things that we know will support us to recover from that, so our social supports, our relationships, trauma most often happens in relationships and recovery from it happens in relationships as well, 
our response to COVID-19 in order to keep ourselves safe means that we're also buffering ourselves from those very things that might support us to recover from pre the, the impact of pre-existing trauma. And we also know that COVID-19, because of our response to it, as also means that we have a little bit more vulnerability to a range of other traumatic events, which can have significant impact on housing and homelessness. For example, we know there's an increased rise in domestic abuse, an increased rise in, in concern also about emotional abuse, physical abuse and se sexual abuse for children without necessarily having the capacity to escape from it. So we have this complex existing picture and then COVID-19 mapping on top of it. Next slide, please. And so I suppose it's really important just briefly to say, what do we mean by a trauma-informed nation? What do we mean by a trauma-informed approach? And I, you know, I could speak for hours on this, as, as, as Laura well, well knows, but I'm just going to briefly summarise that is it means that we all realise the prevalence of trauma and we recognise the impact of trauma, especially with respect to the barriers it can create to accessing life chances. And I think particularly in a housing context, thinking about what are the ways in which the impact of trauma can affect our capacity to access housing, to maintain tenancies, but also the risks of becoming homeless as well. And we know that there are significant overlaps there. My very first job after I qualified was to be the founding member of the um, Greater Glasgow and Clyde Trauma and Homelessness team. And just looking at the, I think the, the term that, that the report that predated that team was disempowerment and disconnection. And that holds in line with the impact of trauma and it also holds in line with how we can feel um, without the basic safety that a, a home can provide for us. A trauma-informed nation responds with that recognition in mind. It knows the barriers that the impact of trauma can create in accessing those life chances. And the key principles do no harm, so don't re-traumatise, support recovery, and create systems that remove potential trauma-related barriers to accessing what we need to recover. And that resilience is recognised and supported, that we often can take a deficits based approach, particularly for people affected by trauma in terms of you know, what's lacking or what they're struggling with. And we're failing to recognise actually the strengths that they bring um, because of their exposure and, and survival through a whole range of different experiences. And relationships matter and that misspelling is intentional. And it was my great colleague Jenny Young that really stressed this in the first instances. Trauma most often happens in relationships and recovery from it most often happens in real relationships with real human beings. Next click, please. And so resisting re-traumatisation is a big part of a trauma-informed nation and system. It means that we all understand that trauma-related memories, feelings and responses can be really easily triggered by subtle or innocuous events or relationships. And a trauma-informed nation, service or individual offers the opposite of a traumatising relationship. Next click. So if everywhere we can make sure that everyone feels safe, that they've got a sense of choice, that they feel and we are genuinely offering collaboration, that they're being empowered, that we support that empowerment and they've got a trusting relationship. We recognise that we have to work harder in order to make sure we gain people's trust because of the lack of trust that's been there before in previous traumatising relationships. If we do all those things in our systems, our services, and our relationships, it means that we are offering the opposite of a traumatising relationship. We are not triggering those trauma related feelings and memories that mean that people will disconnect from us and our services and prevent people from accessing the life chances that they need and deserve. Next click, please. And so this is the vision of the Scottish Government, a trauma informed and responsive nation and workforce that's capable of recognising where people are affected by trauma and adversity, that's able to respond in ways that prevent further harm and support recovery and can address inequalities and improve, and improve life chances. Next click please. And the National Trauma Training Programme is very much about creating, disseminating education and training tools and resources that enable organisations and individuals to create a trauma informed and responsive workforce to support that vision. Next click please. And so what is the National Trauma Training Programme? Well, on the left hand side there, you'll see our fundamental document, which is a knowledge and skills framework, all 130 pages of it, which you don't need to read all of. But basically what it says in really great detail is what do we all need to know and what do we all need to do, be able to do in order to be able to create that trauma informed um, uh, nation? And in recognition of the fact that, you know, the National Trauma Training Programme is not the only show in town, that right hand document, the Scottish Psychological Trauma Training Plan is for organisations and individuals to be able to identify, OK, what training do I need? What knowledge and skills do I need? How do I apply this knowledge and skills framework? And how do I identify good training that will help me develop those knowledge and skills? Not everybody needs to be a trauma expert. In fact, most people need to know just a bit about trauma. So we've divided the workforce into people who need to be trauma informed, trauma skilled, trauma enhanced and trauma specialist. Next click, please. And that's described in this next slide here. If you look at the, the 
pyramid in the middle. We've talked about trauma informed, skilled, enhanced and specialist, and that's leading people kind of from that's really based on the role that you have in working with people affected by trauma. And if you look on the left hand side, people who are trauma informed, skilled, those are the people who don't have an explicit role in the recovery of people affected by trauma, but they do have an explicit role in supporting people to access services. And then at the trauma special and enhanced level, it's people who have an explicit role in supporting children or adults affected by trauma to recover. And when we think about trauma specialists and trauma enhanced people, they're offering evidence based approaches to recognise resilience and support psychological recovery. At the trauma informed and trauma skilled level, that's much more about understanding how the impact of trauma might affect people's responses to you and your organisation. So how might it affect someone's ability to sustain a tenancy or to be able to stay in a house? and adapt how you work so that you do no further harm, so you don't re-traumatize, and the impact of trauma doesn't create a barrier. So you recognize where someone may be fleeing from traumatic events and how that's impacting on their ability to, to be able to access a safe home and your role and be able to support that. Next slide, please. And so how do we implement it? I'm just gonna highlight this document on the right hand side, which is a PDF that you'll get after the session, which is all of the different training resources that we offer at the National Trauma Training Programme. And I would very much encourage you to have a look if you haven't already at our animations, opening doors and sowing seeds about what trauma informed practice actually looks like. And then if you're interested in knowing more, doing the e-module, particularly developing your trauma skill practice on Turas Learn. There's lots of other resources there as well. Next click, please. I'm very aware I'm about to go a minute over time and Laura will be very upset with me for that as, and Elena is nodding. So this is my last slide. And the thing that I wanted to say about this is right front and centre here, we've got workforce knowledge and skills, but that's just one part of creating a trauma informed organisation. You can't pour from an empty cup and we can't expect our workforce to be trauma informed without surrounding them with a trauma informed organisation that they can trust, that they feel safe and they can do those new things that we're asking them to do in a trauma informed way, feeling safe in that. And that takes leadership and organisational support. Leaders have to walk the talk in order to be able to support that and also coach the workforce to be able to use those knowledge and skills and practice. And on the right hand side, there's no such thing as a trauma informed organisation without it being informed by people affected by trauma. So how are we creating and designing housing systems and housing support systems that make sure that we're understanding from the people that are using those systems what they need and how they're experiencing it. And finally, and most importantly, they were collaborate, collaborating and sharing power with people with lived experience of trauma. You know, Jenny Young always talks about there's no such thing as a trauma informed organisation that isn't informed by people affected by trauma. What are they telling us about what we need? It's not about what colour should this room be? It's do we need a room and what should we use that room for? So I think I'll finish there. Apologies for the two minutes extra, but that's a little bit of a gallop through the National Trauma Training Programme. Thank you.